Good evening, everyone, and welcome um, for our second autumn talk in our series um, that the Stained Glass Museum has every year. Delighted to welcome you all. Um, as usual, please do pop in the chat where you're joining us from this evening, um, but welcome. And we have a real treat this evening because it's a double bill for the first time ever. We have two speakers um, speaking to us today about William Burrell's stained glass collection. Um, and I'll ask our speakers just to turn their videos on so that you can see them um, and we'll welcome them. Welcome to Ed Johnson and Mary Grohl. Um, both our speakers are just the, the perfect people to speak to us about this, this topic. And I'll just introduce them both together and then explain how we're going to run this evening's webinar. So Mary Grohl is currently business manager at York Glaziers Trust, a leading conservation studio in York um, associated with the Minster. And she has been there since 2017. Her background is equally technical as it is art historical. She has a PhD um, from the University of York and her PhD was on William Burrell, Thomas Drake and the transatlantic trade in stained glass in the early 20th century. So she is well equipped to talk about the formation of um, the magnificent collection that, of stained glass that William Burrell collected. Ed Johnson um, is currently curator of medieval and renaissance art at Glasgow Museums. He's been working at Glasgow Museums since 2014 and in his current role as curator in medieval, of, of medieval and renaissance art since 2020. Um, prior to that, he's worked for Hull Museums, the National Mining Museum in Scotland, the Museum of London and the British Museum. Um, and he has a master's in medieval history from the University of Edinburgh. So there are two speakers. Um, welcome to both of you. And what we're going to do this evening, because um, it's a little bit different to usual, is um, Mary is going to start speaking to us. She's going to be our first speaker, speaking about the formation of Burroughs collection. And then the second part will go straight into Ed um, after Mary's talk speaking from the kind of museum perspective about the current displays at the Burrell Museum um, today. And if you haven't already picked up the news, the Burrell Collection did win Art Fund Museum of the Year Award this year. So it's really exciting to hear about the, the recent uh, redisplay of this very significant stained glass collection. So without further ado, I will um, hand over to Mary for the first part of the talk and come back at the end. Thank you, Mary. Okay, thank you for that, Jasmine. So this evening, I'm just gonna spend around 20 minutes talking to you about a very significant set of art dealers in terms of the international history of stained glass, the British firm, Thomas and Drake, and talk about their special relationship with the Glaswegian stained glass collector, Sir William Borrell. Um, and the time period that I'm gonna focus on really is the sort of 1920s onwards. The Stained Glass of the Burrell Collection Museum really is a tale of two collections. Uh, one is Burrell's private collection, which he lived surrounded by, and one the collection he acquired only to form a public museum. While Ed will talk about the museum Sir William went on to form, I just want to go back a step and show you the origins of the private collection and the people behind them. So first, the people. The art dealers Thomas and Drake had a stock of thousands of panels of stained glass, which they amassed and sold ferociously during the first half of the 20th century. Most of the stained glass of the v &A in London has come from them, as is the stained glass at the Metropolitan Museum in New York and also the Borrell Collection in Glasgow, the three largest stained glass collections worldwide. These three institutions owe that their rich and vast stained glass holdings to the heavy reliance on Thomas and Drake as their suppliers. Famous multi-millionaire and billionaires, such as the Fords of Ford motor cars, the Woolworths of the Woolworth stores, all appear in Thomas and Drake's purchase books. Chequers, the official residence of the prime ministers of Great Britain is furnished with their stained glass. The founder of Dunlop Tires bought from them also, as did John Rockefeller, who is potentially undisputably the richest man ever to have lived. Their client list was global and, as you can see, extremely impressive. 
Thomas and Drake was officially incorporated in 1922 in London and New York. The company had three partners, and you can see two of them here. So father and son, Grosvenor and Roy Thomas, and later they were joined by Wilfred Drake. They were the only art dealers during the period to specialise solely in the supply of ancient stained glass. And so from their base in London and New York, they had a virtual global monopoly on the art market. Grosvenor Thomas, its figurehead, was a self-taught landscape painter and member of the artist collective, the Glasgow Boys. This included acclaimed artists such as Lavery, Crawl Hall and Whistler, and they practiced in a loose impressionist style. Painting was probably Grosvenor's true passion, and throughout his life, he identified himself foremost as a landscape painter. Painting wasn't just a hobby for him, though. He won several prestigious gold medals at international exhibitions, and although he had this critical acclaim, um, sales of his artworks don't actually seem to be very significant. His son, Roy, who you saw in the earlier slide, spent four years at university studying electrical engineering. That was around the sort of turn of the century when it was a new and complex invention. His career as an, ele as an electrical engineer was short lived and soon after qualifying, he emerges on census records as an art dealer instead. So obviously by now, both father and son believed that they could make enough money for them both by uh, dealing in stained glass. And this was despite neither of them actually having any qualifications at all or any known experience in the stained glass field. From around 1906 to 1922, Grosvenor and Roy bought thousands of panels of stained glass. Technically, you could say that they were the largest ever stained glass collectors, collect, collectors we've ever seen. If you added up all of the major public collections around the world, you still realistically wouldn't approach anywhere near the amount Grosvenor had at any one time. Even Hamp and Stevenson, who were a century previous, were perhaps the best known of the stained glass art dealers, never attempted to buy and sell on this industrial scale. Thomas and Drake's enormous stock of stained glass represents the results of the decline of the English country house. High taxation and dips in agricultural growth led to many of the English landed gentry facing severe economic hardship during the early, early 20th century. With bankrupt aristocrats in abundance looking to sell assets, all the other art dealers grabbed the paintings, rugs and tapestries, but no one really wanted the stained glass. There was no market for it. It couldn't just be unhooked from the wall or rolled up. It needed specialists to remove it from the window openings and was incredibly fragile. And its status as a lesser of the fine arts also devalued it. So Grosvenor had no competition in the sale room. Without venturing far from London, he could obtain rich collections of Dutch, Italian, German, French, English, and even Flemish glass from aristocrats whose ancestors had traveled the continent collecting it as part of their grand tours. While old money gentry struggled in this period, industrialists uh, really did very well. And it was the boom in the new rich that Thomas and Drake were tapping into. By the 1920s, the Thomases went into partnership with Wilfred Drake, a shy and unassuming stained glass restorer whose family were the appointed glaciers to Exeter Cathedral. Wilfred moved from Exeter to London and established the Thomas and Drake workshop in West London and he set about fixing, cleaning and adapting panels for their customers all over the world. Soon after they began their business, however, their charismatic figurehead Grosvenor died, leaving Wilfred and Roy to handle the transatlantic business they'd just formed on their own. It is probable that Wilfred was never really meant to have been customer facing, instead staying behind in the workshop and tinkering with the panels. But he had to step up when Grosvenor died. Um, but it was his really special relationship with Sir William Burrell, which was the one that really came to define the, um, the sort of span of the firm. Sir William Burrell, on the right there, was born in 1861 in Glasgow. His father and grandfather built and ran a shipbuilding business, with Sir William joining the company aged just 14. He married late and his wife suffered from frequent bouts of ill health and mental instability. Their only child, Marion, had a troubled relationship with her parents. She then became estranged from them and she was never to actually inherit any of Burrell's estate. 
Sir William remained active in public life and was knighted in 1927 in recognition of it. Burrell's tastes as an art collector, which you're going to hear more about uh, from Ed later on, was really very wide ranging. But it was his um, it was his stained glass collection that was really particularly very strong. There was between seven and eight hundred panels and whole windows in this collection. Two thirds of the Borrell collection um, were purchased with a with, with the when he decided that he was going to form a public museum. And these were panels that he rarely even saw in the flesh. They were just to go into storage and then go to the museum. And Ed will talk about those later. However, a third of Burrell's vast stained glass collection was purchased much earlier and was acquired only with the decoration of his homes in mind. And it's this much more private and personal collection that I just want to focus in on quickly with you now. So now that you know all about the people, I'm going to look at the houses. So. From at least 1891, William Burrell lived at the classical style townhouse, Four Devonshire Gardens. This was in West Glasgow. He lived there with his mother, Isabella. It was the glazing of a staircase window at this property that initiated his first known involvement with stained glass. In 1892, he, or probably even his mother, commissioned Glasgow based architect and interior designer, George Walton to create this new window. It was based on a 17th century poem. It's not known whether the selection of this subject matter originated with Walton or even with the Burrells themselves, but after Burrell left this house at the turn of the century, no arrangements were made to transfer the window to his new home. The next snapshot occurs in 1901. Burrell loaned a large mixed consignment of objects to the 1901 Glasgow International Exhibition. And among this is the first real evidence of Burrell acquiring non-contemporary stained glass. Although the catalogue entries are extremely vague, they describe at least 23 stained glass medallions. This collection seemed rather a mixed job lot, and here's a selection of them now. It included Dutch, Swiss, German and English stained glass of varying date and also uh, very varying condition. By the time Burrell had settled at 8 Great Western Terrace, which was an 18 room townhouse, also in Glasgow. The Gothic style interiors were laid out by Edinburgh based architect Robert Lorimer. The contemporary photographs that we have uh, illustrate that at least some stained glass was incorporated into selected window openings at the property, as you can see here. Although Burrell had already demonstrated a solid interest in stained glass, uh, though, it was not really until his um, purchase in 1916 of his Scots baronial estate, Hutton Castle, which was in the Scottish, Scottish borders. And here it is. This coincided with Burrell's retirement. And this is when, you know, Burrell really steps from becoming a sort of minor collector of art to becoming a really major collector. From around 1927, Burrell began to concentrate on the furnishing of the castle. And for that, he used a, a firm called Acton Sergi, and they were formerly called White Allen, and they had been um, involved in the decoration of Buckingham Palace, amongst other places. Thomas and Drake were appointed as Burrell's stained glass advisors. Hutton Castle is now in private hands and has been much altered. It reflects little of its appearance during Burrell's occupation. Although the general location and appearance of the Hutton rooms, rooms that were selected for reconstruction in the new museum later on, um, give us some form of an indication as the appearance of the rooms in the castle, other parts of the house have unfortunately been entirely lost. For reasons of practicality, the proportions, orientation, and especially locations of the window openings were changed in the Hutton rooms as seen in Glasgow Muse uh, in the Burrell Museum. In the 1950s, there was a plan for many more of the rooms at Hutton Castle to be reassembled at the museum, but the idea was very swiftly abandoned. Surviving floor plans, a catalogue of stained glass authored by Thomas and Drake, and a limited number of photographs are now all that remains. So I've combined these together to reconstruct Burrell's Hutton Castle again. So I'm just going to whisk through them really fast and then return to some of the slides. So 
The main entertaining spaces were located in the western wing of the castle, beginning with the Great Hall on the ground floor. This was directly below a double height drawing room. The two spaces were connected by what Burrell termed the western staircase. Other entertaining spaces could be found in the middle range of the property on the first floor, such as the billiard and dining rooms. Also in the middle range were the Burrell's more private and functional rooms, such as the business room and on the ground floor, um, family and guest bedrooms on the second, third and fourth floors. The servants' quarters were spread across the relatively newly built late 19th century eastern termination of the castle. The glazing of the castle, the castle with ancient stained glass took two years. There were hundreds and hundreds of letters exchanged between Wilfred Drake and Burrell, and they reveal that the drawing room was the first room at Hutton Castle to have been glazed. This included two French early 16th century windows, one depicting the life of St John the Evangelist and one a tree of Jesse. The actual process of installation was undertake, undertaken by Norman MacLeod MacDougall. He was the former chief glass painter at Daniel Cotier's studio. However, the majority of the restoration and adaption of the panels was undertaken by Wilfred Drake down in London. The glaciers took around three months to complete the drawing room windows. Work progressed from the drawing room to the ground floor vestibule, here's the picture on the right, into the ground floor great hall, which is the picture on the left, and its connecting western staircase. Panels installed in the great hall were again largely figural and religious in subject matter, including a French 15th century window depicting St Cecilia and the angels, a French 16th century window showing the meeting at the Golden Gate, and a Flemish 15th century adoration. A total of 128 panels of stained glass had reportedly been installed throughout the property by November 1928. And that's a rough sort of halfway point. By late January 1929, the Lancet windows of the square shaped medieval tower were filled, and a 12th century panel depicting the prophet Jeremiah was set in a narrow window in the adjoining circular tower staircase. And this Burrell was really proud of as it was one of the oldest panels that he had, he'd, he'd ever owned. 18 months after the first glass is reported to have gone in, a total of around 222 panels were now on display at the castle. Rooms glazed by this date must have included the several cloakrooms, lavatories, corridors and bedrooms, sitting rooms, as well as the business and billiard rooms and various rooms in the servants' quarters. Even in some of the more unimportant rooms, the glass was of still of exceptional quality. For example, if you did visited the Ladies' Loo, St Mary of Egypt would have been staring right back at you. One of the final areas to have received its stained glass was the first floor dining room, despite its importance as an entertaining space for guests. Several of the panels for this room were not purchased until at least May 1930, including a German 14th century window depicting St John the Baptist. By the beginning of 1931, by his own estimations, Burrell now had 233 panels and windows on display at, at the castle, growing soon after to 250 by 1932. This was a huge and highly concentrated display of stained glass. Such an extensive domestic display can only really have borne comparison to Thomas and Drake's near contemporary glazing of an English revival style Ronelay Manor in Pennsylvania in the USA, where around 100 English medieval armorials were purchased between 1924 and 1927 by American heiress Eleanor Widener Dixon. Almost a third of the rooms at the manor included ancient stained glass, including the main reception rooms, stairwells and bedrooms, as well as various pantries. The Dixon's, the Dixon's collection of stained glass was less than half that of Burrell's and far more narrow in its scope, consisting only of English medieval armorials set in plain quarried surrounds, with the exception of a handful of Dutch secular panels. Letters between Drake and Burrell show a very strong awareness of this collection, and they frequently use this collection as a benchmark of quality. The publishing in London in 1927 of a colour illustrated stained glass catalogue made the Dixon collection widely accessible to international audiences. Thomas and Drake were thanked for their services in the catalogue. Its release was just a year before Burrell's glaziers began work at Hutton Castle, 
And it's possible that Borrell intentionally leaned on the service of Thomas and Drake from this point onwards due to their heavy involvement with the Dixons. Borrell's closest European counterpart was probably Liverpool-based antiquarian Dr Philip Nelson, who was another heir to a significant shipping fortune. Like Burrell's, Nelson's collection of glass was large, totalling around 400 panels by the time of his death in 1953, but it's not clear actually of what proportion of Nelson's acquisitions were actually installed in, in his South Liverpool home, Beechwood, as no records of this property and its contents survive. Burrell was also very aware of Nelson's collecting activities, though. Burrell continued to augment and refine his collection over the successive decades, unlike Thomas and Drake's other customers and unlike the Dixons. They instead commonly decorated in one short, sharp glazing campaign with no further alteration. In letters to Drake, Burrell's taste clearly emerges and he chooses to refine his private collection along two lines. He wants the glass to be English and he wants richness of colour. In all of his correspondences with Drake, Burrell never discussed an interest in iconography or expressed a wish to source or acquire panels because of any sort of specific sub subject matter. This was not the driver for him at all. Aside from Burrell and Drake, there is only minimal evidence of anyone else's input in the glazing decisions. And so Burrell was really quite free to form his collection along his own lines. His wife, Constance, though, had a direct hand in just a single purchase, and that is this panel here on the screen, a 15th century English depiction of Princess Cecily. Burrell never installed it at the castle, but he did let her purchase it. In Burrell's and Lady Burrell's respective bedrooms, as well as in their bathrooms, Dutch panels had originally been installed in the 1920s glazing campaign. By 1932, Burrell had instructed that these be substituted with English stained glass. Very swiftly, two weeks later, Burrell instructed for further um, continental glass in the billiard room and other places in the castle to be swapped. However, some continental glass remained. The gentleman's cloakroom retained its Flemish 15th century win window depicting the marriage at Canar, and the series of French and Flemish windows in the drawing room and tower staircase also escaped this wave of alterations. His daughter Marion's suite of rooms on the top floor of the castle contained several panels of Swiss glass, and again these just stayed throughout. Only English was also not a consideration in Burrell's acquisition of, say, Chinese ceramics, Dutch, Flemish and German tapestries, or even 19th century paintings, which he collected in abundance. However, the installation of only English stained glass did start to align very heavily with his English Gothic interiors, which also incorporated his purchases of medieval furniture, firestone surrounds, oak panelling and other architectural salvages. English armorials began to be collected by Borrell in greater numbers during this period, which would be appropriate accessories in the creation of a traditional English manorial setting. As a proud Scotsman, he did not mind the overt Englishness of his interiors. Of the 250 panels recorded to have been installed at Hutton Castle by this time, no less than 150 were now English armorial. Borrell's collection of stained glass was not only confined to the main house, but extended to the servants' quarters. I cannot stress to you how unusual this was. In the western and central sections of the house occupied by the Burrells, other purely functional servants' rooms, such as pantries and cleaning cupboards, also contained valuable medieval stained glass. Almost 50 panels, a fifth of Burrell's entire collection at this time, had been installed throughout both the upper and ser lower servants' halls, but the staircase, servants' corridor, maid staircase, and many of the bedrooms occupied by the servants. Descriptions of servants' quarters of the period suggest that these were only sparsely furnished spaces and certainly not areas where you would encounter expensive and breakable artworks. What prompted such an extensive glazing campaign in these areas in particular remains a mystery, and Burrell and Drake never discussed the reasoning. Burrell was not known to have been an exceptionally generous employer. In fact, he was known as frugal, and there are no other recorded instances of an owner of a great house doing this in the servants' areas. The installation of stained glass here was not because Burrell had run out of space in the main house. The panels installed in the female servant staircase and upper servant's hall 
were installed just seven months into the two-year glazing campaign, well before many of the main rooms had received their stained glass, indicating that from the beginning there was a deliberate plan to decorate these spaces. The expenses associated with the glazing of the servants' areas were significant, not least the costs connected to their specialist repair and installation, but also their initial acquisition. A French 15th century Madonna installed in the butler staircase was one of Burrell's most expensive purchases of stained glass ever. High value artworks like this were placed in areas of the house that would not have been appropriate for his family and his guests to have entered. So why place them here? Burrell installed protective glazing to guard against their damage as he had done also with all of the glass in the house proper. There's no clear evidence to suggest that Burrell's enriching of the servants' rooms fulfilled any sort of educational endeavor. So this too isn't really the answer. Placement by subject matter seems largely rather random and everything again seems guided by aesthetics only. Arguably the most appropriate selection of panels could be found in the servants' hall, where there appeared roundels depicting peasants and as part of a labors of the month series. This presumably related more easily to the lives of the servants than the donor figures of rich noble women found in the windows adjacent. However, what is maybe most interesting, but perhaps coincidental, is the presence in female sections of the servants' quarters of a series of virgin martyrs, such as Saints Catherine and Barbara. These may have been intended as models of virtuous behaviour, as would have been promoted among the young female single staff members. This same combination of saints is also found in windows directly outside Burrell's wife's bedroom. The extensive glazing of Hutton Castle was extraordinary in many ways. Not only was the main house glazed with unprecedented amounts of stained glass, but also in the, in a most unusual move, the servants' quarters and sundry cupboards and toilets. Now that these panels have been divorced from this setting and are now mixed with hundreds of Burrell's later acquisitions for the museum, this re-establishing of the glazing of his homes becomes all the more important. It serves to underline the special link some of Burrell's panels had to Burrell's everyday life and indeed where the ambitious spark of a museum first formed. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Ed now to talk more about that, that very museum that came next. Thank you very much for that, uh, Marion. That was great. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. So I'm hoping that if I do this, um, hopefully you can all see my slide. Um, so I will uh, begin. Um, yes, uh, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for coming uh, along tonight. Uh, I'm Ed Johnson. I'm the curator of medieval and Renaissance art at the Borough Collection. And following on from uh, Mary's excellent introduction to Sir William and his growing stained glass collection, I would like to take the narrative forward just a little and delve into the following years. So looking at the period um, preceding the gift of Burrell's entire collection to the city of Glasgow in 1944, uh, and then the eventual founding of the museum in 1983. And I'm going to briefly touch on these sort of ethos and principles that guided the original building um, before turning to the continuities and the changes that have taken place with the recent renovation and our approach to display today, with of course a focus on that integration and interpretation of the stained glass. Now, as we've seen, the Burrell collection was amassed by um, Sir William Burrell and his wife, uh, Lady Constance Burrell. And it's, it's home to around 9,000 objects in total, and it's a quite a, an eclectic mix. So it brims with highlights and pieces from all over the world it represents some sort of six millennia or so of human artistic achievement. And it's notable for its really fine and extensive collection of Chinese bronzes and ceramics. It's got Islamic carpets. Uh, it's late 19th and early 20th century art. Uh, there's a much celebrated collection of French impressionists, for example. But I don't think I'm showing any particular unfair curatorial bias when I say that it's the medieval and Renaissance art, particularly that of Northern Europe, from around the 13th to the 16th centuries, which was always Burrell's first love and is arguably the strongest part of the collection. Now, the medieval and Renaissance collection ranges from, as you can see on this slide here, there's, there's monumental stone architecture, there's oak furniture, there's uh, tapestry and sculpture, right through to small handheld ivories and metalwork and tableware. 
But as we've seen, it's particularly notable for its truly world-class collection of stained glass, which at around 800 pieces is, as we've heard, comparable in its breadth and its quality with institutions like the Met in New York and the V&A. Now, initially, as uh, Maria has indicated, Sir William's collection of stained glass was built primarily for his family home at Houghton Castle. But what becomes apparent, though, is that from around the 1930s, mid-1930s perhaps, there's this shift in his buying practices. And although Burrell's formal agreement to gift his entire collection to the Glasgow Corporation wasn't made until 1944, it was clear that Burrell had decided to build up his holdings with the aim of establishing a museum-worthy collection by the mid-1930s. And as we heard, in fact, really about two-thirds, over two-thirds of the stained glass collection, as we know it today, was purchased from the mid-1930s, not for inclusion at Hutton, but for inclusion in a future museum dedicated to uh, his collection. So now, I suppose, no longer confined by the, the window space at Hutton, um, a series of important acquisitions were made. Um, and so there's some nice examples from 1938, 1939, um, and some of these really significant pieces coming from the collection of William Randolph Hearst, the great American newspaper tycoon, and one of the greater masses of medieval art. Now, although Burrell, who, as we discussed earlier, was frugal and careful with his money, he, he had to be in order to build the collection that he built. Um, and he certainly, he bemoaned paying what he regarded as very full prices for the editions that you see coming from Hearst in the 1930s. But it was these and, and other later pieces, many secured through Thomas and Drake, that prompted Drake to remark that at this point, Burrell stained glass was now the finest private collection in existence. And so on this slide, we see some of the very fine glass that was purchased during this period from Hearst. And um, a window that Burrell was uh, particularly delighted with, it, we can see here on the left, is from the French 13th century. Um, it's a feast scene that originated in the windows of uh, Clermont-Ferrand Cathedral. And he was so proud of this piece, as virtually all of the glass spare the bellows um, that you can see in the bottom panel and some of the sections in the border are thought to be authentic, as is rather astonishing the lead which all appears to be intact and largely unrestored after 700 years. Now, understandably, a panel like this would never have been intended to be placed in the windows at Hutton, facing all the elements there in Berwickshire. But now he could buy these pieces to make a fine addition to what he intended to be a museum collection. And there was other great additions bought at this time. So on the right of the slide, we see some of the monumental glass from the Carmelite Church of Boppard on Rhine. These are the largest lights in the collection, and these would have been far too vast to have fit in any sort of window at Hutton. Um, and it's likely that Burrell would have only seen these on very rare occasions when they would have remained largely crated. Um, and even you know, beyond the gift of 1944, Burrell continued to expand his stained glass holdings to strengthen and build up what was now this publicly owned um, collection. And it was in the late 1950s that Burrell enjoyed one of his last uh, and greatest stained glass collecting coups when he was you know, approaching 90 years old. And it came in the form of this fine selection of um, English heraldic glass, which if we heard became a, a real passion of his. Um, and it's a near complete series of 39 panels, originally from the great hall of Fawcett Hall in Northamptonshire. Now these were a much sought after addition Burrell chased them for 11 years, actually, uh, before he could finally secure them for the collection in 1950. Um, and again, as well as appealing to Burrell's love of English heraldic armorial glass, there's a great deal of authenticity with these panels, very little evidence of re-leading. And these are, in fact, some of the very best heraldic panels that we find in the collection. Um, and they really showcase, when you get close to them, that fine dexterity of the 16th century glaziers and their ability to produce these increasingly complex quarterings. Now, ultimately, what motivated and prompted Sir William to build up and then hand over this extraordinary collection is quite difficult to determine. Um, Burrell, unfortunately for us, he was, he was no diarist. There's no great memoir that can provide an explicit window into his thinking. Um, although he did occasionally open up at small, intimate gatherings where his thoughts on art were sometimes recorded. 
So for example, at the opening of a small exhibition in 1947 in Berwick, he was reported to have remarked that um, art, to my mind, is the most fascinating, most delightful, and uh, at the same time, the most educative hobby anyone could take up. He not only taught one to know that art was beautiful, but it helped one in many other directions. It brushed up one's geography and improved history like nothing else could. And I think this insight, although fleeting, um, does reveal something of Burrell's belief in the educational power of art and its ability to enrich people's lives. And it's very clear that he did want the public to have access to great art. That's reflected not only in his gift of 1944, but the extensive loans of his collection that he made to innumerable museums and galleries, cathedrals and colleges up and down the UK um, throughout his life. Um, in addition, Burrell also had a profound sense of public duty, which no doubt influenced his decision to donate the collection. Uh, and that was seen through long stints as a local councillor in both Glasgow and Berwickshire. I think also possibly the deterioration in the relationship with his daughter that was mentioned earlier made it clear that there was going to be no sort of um, family to take on the collection. I'm sure that played uh, a part. And I think there was also no doubt this degree of personal pride and vanity, perhaps. Um, you know, the gifting of the collection to Glasgow was a way to ensure Burrell's legacy. So while he often publicly would shun the limelight, stating that it was the collection, not the collector, that was the important thing, he did, however, stipulate that the collection be kept as a whole, and that importantly, it would be housed in a standalone museum, which was to carry his name as the Burrell collection. Thus, I suppose, I suppose anchoring you know, his position into the cultural landscape of, of the country. Now, the city's search for a permanent home for Burrell's gift was a long one. Um, initially, it looked towards several historic sites and period properties on the fringes of Glasgow, with Burrell stipulating that the treasures be kept um, in a sort of parkland setting, not too close to the city centre. He had particular fears about the detrimental effects of air pollution in the city at that time, typically on his tapestries. Um, but ultimately, all of these initial schemes, various reasons, some which became quite developed, failed to get off the ground. And the matter of the collection's long-term home was unresolved for decades. Now, although there were, uh, in the mid-20th century, a number of high-profile exhibitions throughout the country, which did showcase elements of the collection, uh, including some substantial amounts of stained glass, some of which you can see on the, on the slides here, um, without a permanent home, it was inevitable, really, that um, public access to the collection was rather limited. And the first significant breakthrough comes really in 1967. So this is some nine years after Burrell's death, when Dame Anne Maxwell MacDonald presented the city with her ancestral home, uh, Pollock House, and the surrounding 360 acres of Pollock Park. And so it was this other extraordinary gift to the city that at last a suitable site for a new purpose-built museum is found within the grounds of this park, which is actually uh, Glasgow's largest green space. Now, um, an exceptional collection, of course, needs an exceptional setting. So it was in 1970 that an architectural competition was launched to design and deliver a permanent home for the borough collection. Now, in total, I think it was 242 entries that were received as part of that competition. And we're incredibly fortunate that Glasgow Special Collections Archive still holds uh, many of these submissions. And on this slide, I've just put uh, a small number three there to give you some idea of the differing uh, and in some cases rather <laughs> eccentric approaches to the building design. Yes, that is a building in the shape of three cows, if you're wondering there in the center. I don't know how that would have worked. I should have to think where the offices would have been. Um, but the, the design that was eventually agreed upon, however, was um, that proposed by three young academic architects from Cambridge, Barry Gasson, John Munier, and Britt Anderson. And after some further setbacks, there's always setbacks, um, the building finally opened to the public in October 1983. Now, the brief for the competition went into great detail of the history of the collection, its contents and Burrell's taste. And importantly, it drew attention to a series of medieval and early modern architectural fragments purchased by Burrell in the 1950s 
again from the collection of William Randolph Hearst, who we mentioned earlier. Um, the largest piece being the Hornby portal, which you can see on the left here, 16th century doorway from Hornby Castle in North Yorkshire. These were pieces that Burrell, who was then in his 90s, had bought with the intention of including into the fabric of a future museum, as he felt it would help knit the collection and the building, wherever it was, whatever form it took, together. And so reiterating Burrell's initial plans, the brief stated that these fragments should um, provide a, a reference for the tapestries, stained glass, sculpture, and metal work of these periods. And the building that emerged in 1983 with this sleek and quite understated design delivered on that brief perfectly, really, unfussily incorporating these elements into the very fabric of the building, um, as well as you know, tying the building to this unique woodland landscape that we're in, with views way out to the surrounding parklands and the woodlands, and also the galleries were all orientated to make the most of the natural light that was afforded by the location. But importantly for us today, the design also expanded on this idea, this architectural um, inclusion, and it utilized the medieval and the Renaissance stained glass in a similar fashion, incorporating a selection of panels um, alongside the masonry into the architecture, where it was mounted primarily along the southern uh, frontage of the building, where it's able to make the most of the natural changing light. And in some sense, I suppose, presenting the glass as was intended, as opposed to against the flat static luminosity of artificial light. Um, and as we'll see shortly, this rather successful approach is one that we've built upon and even expanded in the new galleries. Um, also, of course, you know, alongside this gallery, as you can see in the bottom left, there's a traditionally lit stained glass gallery using artificial light, which had a good selection of glass, but was predominantly home to the smaller heraldic panels and roundels. Now, um, upon opening, the museum initially enjoyed considerable success. We welcomed over a million visitors in our first year alone. The building received various plaudits, including UK Museum of the Year in 1985. And the building itself became one of very few Category A listed post-war buildings in Scotland. However, um, over time, particularly in that final decade before the building was eventually closed for refurbishment in 2016, um, the museum really did begin to show its age. Um, physically, it was struggling to remain watertight. So water ingress was really resulting in objects being removed from display over safety concerns. And this was really, I suppose, no more acutely felt than along that southern glazed facade, where leaks had reduced the original 45 panels of stained glass displayed in that area to a meager and rather sparse looking 34. And you can get a sense of that rather patchy uh, and unsatisfactory appearance of glass before closing in the image in the bottom right corner. Alongside the structural failures that desperately needed addressing, by 2016, the museum had long since stopped being the public draw that it once was too. Um, economic challenges meant that galleries had remained largely static and unchanged for nearly three decades. It looked tired. It offered little of value to repeat visitors. And so numbers collapsed to way under about 200,000 visitors per annum. And that was in contrast to increased visits by both local and touristic groups at all the other museums that we run in the city of Glasgow. So it's sort of the, the sick man of Glasgow. And the public's expectations for what a museum should be had also shifted considerably. So surveys conducted with the public prior to closure in 2016 reported that many, particularly in the local area, perceived the museum as uninviting. There was a genuine fear of being unwelcome and people lacked the confidence really in engaging with the collections. They felt out of place and there was this sense the museum offered them nothing, no opportunity to touch or interact with the collection, no opportunity to explore and importantly enjoy what was and indeed still is their collection. Also, the visitor profile was no longer reflective of the demographics of Glasgow or Scotland more broadly. And so Burrell was seeing this underrepresentation of families, children and young people, which admittedly is not entirely unusual for fine art collections, but nonetheless, it was something we wanted to try and amend. And 
even amongst what was that core of older adult groups that were still visiting, we were still seeing a quite sustained uh, and dramatic overall drop in attendance. So this resulted in the Burrell Renaissance project, which was a, a multi-million pound redevelopment of the building and displays overseen by the architects, John McCaslin and partners and the designers event communications. Now, the plan was that this would not only restore and reinvigorate the building itself, repairing the fabric of the building, enhancing its environmental performance, updating various elements to meet modern museum standards, such as the glazing, for example, but also create a state of the art 21st century museum that was welcoming to all that removed physical, cultural, social, and intellectual barriers to engagement. The new museum, I suppose it was hoped, would manage the considerable and I suppose quite complex challenge to diversify and develop new audiences without alienating existing visitors. So it had to be a space that reconciled the needs of those that wanted a more interactive, family-friendly experience and those that wanted a more reflective experience. So I suppose, in a nutshell, and the philosophy for the refurbishment was to deliver a world-class art museum informed, of course, by robust academic research that put objects at the heart of the displays, but which also belonged to the people of Glasgow and was accessible to all. And to help realise this vision, the museum's dialogue with the public did not end in 2016. Throughout the entire process, the borough team held sessions and consulted with a diverse body of individuals and community groups, and in total, some 15,000 people were consulted to help develop and shape the future museum. And what became clear was that people wanted more engagement and more interaction, some digital, digital and tactile elements as well. These different approaches that helped increase access and meet different audience needs. And there was also this enthusiasm for a biographical approach to the interpretation that explored the stories of those behind the arts, those who made, owned, or otherwise interacted with the pieces on display. And there was a desire to explore the ideas of craft and design behind the pieces. And these slides, which I'll just pass over here, I suppose give some idea of the new approaches seen in the refurbished galleries that opened in March, 2022. So we have interactive and digital elements, a bit more of a sort of sensory experience. There's tactile, touchable pieces that offer the opportunity to explore collections in different ways. But hopefully you can also see that it's the objects that, of course, are still at the heart of the displays. And we still look to make the most of the unique building and its unique surroundings. But one of the most important and significant changes was that the visitor spaces were greatly expanded. So old office space on the upper floors, for example, was turned over to galleries and what we have as a result is about 35% more display space. And this had huge implications for the display of stained glass. And it allowed for a whole new gallery that sort of replicated the established architectural inspired method of display um, along that museum south facade. So as a result, um, what you get now is a, a dramatic new south face and dramatic new welcome as you approach the museum. So I apologize to my rather shoddy photography there in the top left. You can't really see it that well, but hopefully this nighttime shot um, does offer some idea of how you're met on arrival now by two floors of glazing, as opposed to the original one. And they're both studded with stained glass, creating a vast, almost church-like feel. And at night in particular, it's beautiful. It just shines out in the park, um, almost reliquary, casket-like. It's lovely. Um, now, the intention in these gallery spaces uh, along the south facade was again to build on the strengths of the old concept, and create an airy, uh, quite relaxed space where visitors could take in the glass, bathed in this sort of kaleidoscope of colour, as you can see. Uh, and um, in contrast with the earlier building, the stained glass is a lot more extensive, um, but also it's been lowered to allow it to be viewed and appreciated more closely. Now, this approach was also informed by visitor research when it was related to us that people enjoyed getting close to the glass and being able to appreciate the colour and the craftsmanship while also enjoying a contemplative and atmospheric space. But that was also paired with this desire to explore the history and the stories behind how the glass was made that was involved in the process and some exploration of those depicted. So 
in order to try and strike this balance, the displays in these galleries do carry some light and modest interpretation. Um, but that in itself is quite a shift to the old burrow, where there was effectively no interpretation at all through label texts beyond what we call tombstone information. So you would have a title, a date, a place of origin. And it was felt that this sort of approach left some people feeling quite alienated and as though they were expected to arrive with a certain degree of prior knowledge. So the new interpretation, while looking to respond to the minimalist sensory approach that was favored by visitors, does seek to gently introduce some ideas and concepts. Now, I won't spend the remainder of this talk going into a comprehensive rundown of all the stories present in the galleries, because that would take hours. Um, and I'd also like you all to come along and experience the galleries for yourself, if, if indeed you can. But to give some idea, uh, on the ground floor, for example, uh, where we have built upon that original stained glass gallery, um, uh, we've sort of, yeah, like I say, greatly expanded on that original display, but creating a much more dense hang. Uh, we've got stories that look to explore and introduce the use of religious stained glass as a, a didactic and instructive religious tool. Um, for example, we look at how artists intended glazing to be accessible and easily recognized from distance. And then with some of these narratives, like the legend of St. John the Baptist, as you can see in this wonderful glass from Rouen, they're explored in a little more detail. So the scenes are picked out and explained. Um, and we also look to introduce Burrell himself a little in this space and his collecting practices. So um, here we see an introduction to Burrell's pursuit of the glass from Horsley Hall that I, I just mentioned earlier. Upstairs, we see stained glass positioned in an entirely new gallery dedicated to glaziers and glass making more broadly. So this includes table glass and vessel glass alongside the stained glass. And that is uh, one in a suite of seven new galleries on this level where objects are arranged by material that explore the idea of craft, design, material and technique and allow visitors the opportunity to get a better understanding of the skills and the ingenuity of the makers. So in this gallery, you will encounter some of those tactile and digital elements that we briefly mentioned, but these are largely concerned with the traditional methods of manufacture of vessel glass. So right now there are video screens that show videos of glass blowers and Murano and contemporary engraving. There's digital interactives that introduce glass blowing and vessel shaping and illustrations that look to present the fundamentals of glass production. But it's the stained glass that is really at the heart of the display here. And it's largely, again, situated against the, the outward facing windows, it's lit by natural light. Um, but again, it takes this paired back approach to interpretation, allowing for that sensory and more meditative approach that was favored by visitors. So these are also supported though, as you can see by sort of clustered what we call totems, these standing up displays that you can see with the black uh, in these images, which are more backlit in a traditional manner and again, it allows us to get more stained glass into this space. Now we're fortunate that the stained glass collection of Sir William Burrell is so comprehensive, taking in all the sort of major glass working centers of medieval Renaissance Northern Europe, that we can trace a variety of different developments, trends, uh, processes and techniques across some four centuries. So that in these displays, what we can do really, as you can see from this example of labeling here, we can explore, for example, the chemistry of stained glass color, the development of silver stain and enamels and the, the techniques used to paint on glass, as well as how glass was assembled and hopefully give some insight into the skill and ingenuity involved in the manufacture of stained glass. And the hope really is that people are given, again, in quite a gentle way, but they are given an introduction that can help them explore stained glass with a little bit more confidence not only through the borough, but beyond in museum collections and you know, in great state houses throughout, throughout the world. And here we see some other examples of our label text in this space that we hope strikes that balance of being accessible. Because again, this is a, a museum collection for the people of Glasgow, um, regardless of, of their background, age. Um, so it has to be open to quite a wide selection of the public, but hopefully we get that balance without patronizing what was our existing core audience. It's a, it's a difficult balancing act. 
Beyond these dedicated stained glass galleries, um, panels are of course dotted throughout the remaining displays. Now, unlike the material based approach that we've just talked about on the upper levels with the makers galleries, the other galleries are arranged thematically and cross-culturally. So for example, uh, heraldic stained glass appears in a space that explores the use and meaning of color, not just in early modern, uh, sorry, yeah, early modern Western Europe, but right across the collection. So taking in our wonderful Chinese ceramics and Islamic collections. And so it explores the different cultural contexts of the use and exploitation of, of color. And there are some very fine examples in a gallery that explores human relationships, the ideas of family, love, friendship, and marriage. So for example, we have a story here called The Need for an Heir. And we see these heraldic panels of Henry VIII quartered with Catherine of Aragon and Jane Seymour, which are positioned, and you can see the, the image there on the left, below a silk valance, which was made for the royal bedchamber of Henry and Anne Boleyn. And below that, um, one of the highlights of the collection, which is a bedhead, which we believe was made for the marriage of Henry and his fourth wife, Anne of Cleves. Um, and again, you can see that label text here, and you can see this sort of approach of trying to create engaging texts that offer key points, but quickly, succinctly, and hopefully excessively. Um, and there are many other examples in the galleries. Um, but one of the most sort of striking changes for those that may have been familiar with the old building is the removal of the so-called Hutton rooms. So these are the displays that we briefly talked about that look to present three recreations of Burrell's principal display rooms at Hutton Castle. So the hall, the dining room and the drawing room. Uh, now before closing, research indicated that less than 5% of visitors were pausing to look into these rooms. And when they did, it was for seconds only. Um, as you can see from the image, you know, the old image from the top left is quite a good one. You can see that the, the, the space is cordoned off, it's inaccessible. And basically it leaves a lot of these objects performing something that, a role that's little beyond set dressing, I suppose, including the stained glass, which again, as you can see from the images on the left, which shows the old Hutton rooms, particularly one on the bottom left, um, the glass is often obscured and they're you know, underutilized frankly. So the removal of two of these rooms, which was perhaps the most controversial change in the whole building, and it did receive something of a kickback. Um, but what we have now is, is one room, which looks to, um, which is the room seen on the right, that looks to reproduce the ambience of Hutton. Uh, and it does retain some of the glass to give you an idea of how Burrell lived with this collection. But importantly, it's the space you can now enter. And so you can get closer to the glass, closer to the tapestry, closer to the furniture, um, and the glass that has been removed from the other rooms is now redistributed in more accessible ways throughout other galleries. Um, another notable change just before we finish up was the removal of a little used lecture theatre, which is seen here on the left. Um, that's given way to this large, open, three-storey atrium type space at the heart of the building, where you now see some of our most monumental glass, including the Boffard glass mentioned earlier. And you can fully appreciate and examine the glass from different levels as it resides in this suitably majestic way now over a program of public events in this space. But ultimately, the result is that there's far more stained glass on display now than ever before. So there's well over 300 of the finest panels in the collection, which can now be seen and appreciated more fully. Um, included in that 300, there's about 100 which have never been on permanent display before. Um, and in addition, those that aren't on display are all now stored on site in a newly built state-of-the-art stores. And the plan is to introduce our only guided tours into these stores, but also open them up to the public and researchers alike. And it'd be wonderful to become sort of a, a recognized center for the research of, of stained glass. Um, I'm getting to the end now, but just, Beyond that, um, all 800 or so panels are now fully photographed and they're online with descriptions, which you can find simply by searching for Glasgow Museum's Collections Navigator on your web browser. Uh, and if you search on the search bar there uh, with this sort of prefix that you'll see, well, 45 dot asterisk, you run that in the search, that will bring up all the burl stained glass. And I would just like to say that I would really like to welcome you all to have a look through the collection um, it'd be great to make the most of the expertise that I'm sure are here this evening. And I do 
genuinely welcome any insight or thoughts that you might have on the collection. So please do feel free to contact me by the email below. Um, just to finish up, ultimately feedback from visitors in our first year was overwhelmingly positive. We've welcomed over 600,000 people in the first 12 months, 74% of whom had never been to the borough before. 45% of those visiting came from out with Scotland, um, a lot of international visitors. Uh, and that was also a big impetus of the renovation, the redevelopment to try and um, create a more international profile for the borough. Um, and most importantly, all of those questions during this period so that they would recommend the museum to friends or family. So in that vein, I would recommend and hope and invite you all to please do come, uh, make the trip to Glasgow, experience the museum for yourself if you can. Uh, as was mentioned, we recently delighted to have been awarded the Artful Museum of the Year for 2023. And so now is an excellent time to come, visit, see the award-winning galleries and the world-class stained glass for yourself. Um, thank you very much. That's me. Thank you so much, Ed, and also Mary. Um, do you pop back, Mary, so that we can see you too. Um, thank you to both our speakers for such excellent insight into one of the most significant collections of stained glass in the UK. I'm very jealous of the new stained glass displays and also of the fact that Burrell had St. Mary of Egypt in his loo, because it's a great panel, one of my faves. <laughs> um, those of you who are st still with us this evening, um, if you've got questions for our speakers, now is your chance. So please do pop your Q and A, uh, your questions in the Q and A or the chat. Um, and I guess also because Ed and, and Mary, I've, I've paired them together today, they may have questions for each other. So I'm not stopping you, ask each other questions as well and continue the dialogue. Do either of you have any questions for each other burning? Oh, that's one. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I suppose in terms of your um, selection of stained glass for display, obviously, yeah. as we all know, there are practical reasons why some panels over others would need to take priority and things like that. And obviously, obviously, the space involved and how to light mm -hmm. things. In terms of the other considerations, uh, what, what were they for you, um, you know, aside from condition and display area availability? Well, it, it was as we sort of started to develop, well, I say as we, I came in after all the content had been decided. So I'm, I'm speaking on my colleague's behalf here, but really once the sort of key themes and key messages had been decided, that was also obviously the big driver. What stained glass helps tell these stories and these elements that we're looking at. So when we were looking at say the makers galleries, when we're looking at things like the use of yellow stain, what have we got that shows that off across a range perhaps of different um, locations and different times? If we're looking at the use of ruby glass, what have we got that shows the development of that kind of thing? So, but, so that was a big consideration. But yeah, of course, condition is a big one. Um, and it's difficult, you know, you've got 800 panels to choose from. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, there's a load in store, which I would love to get out. Um, so future temporary exhibitions, I will get as much out as I can, I promise. <laughs> um, I have another question for, for Ed, actually, well, whilst we're, we're quizzing Ed. Um, sorry, because you've only just finished speaking. Um, mm -hmm. And it's actually about the, the gift to, to Glasgow, because I know that mm -hmm. he gifted, Burrell gifted his collection to Glasgow, but then the whole competition for the museum and the building of the museum years later, I mean, did he also leave money for that or was that funded by Glasgow? How did that... So I think there, there was money left. There was the best part of half a million pounds left. Um, but that, I might be wrong here, but I don't think that was left for the building. That was left for sort of future acquisitions and what have you. The building largely had to be funded by Glasgow, uh, as I understand it, um, which was why some of the original plans sort of fell down, really. Um, yeah, so... Yes, I mean there is there is money, but it was it was largely for the expanding the collection later on. Yeah. Uh, so I see there's a question that's just popped up about the Vale Royal windows. Uh, no, they're not in the cafe anymore. They are still on display, so they've been moved into. You'll see a good selection of them 
uh, throughout the museum, actually, there's a nice cluster of them in the, the southern facade galleries that I talked about. They're not still in the coffee shop, though. Um, just decided that they were safer elsewhere and more accessible elsewhere. They were very high up in the cafe. And I have I have been um, actually it was the, the day of the announcement of the Museum of the Year. And, and I can tell everyone that the displays are looking excellent. The glass is really visible and um, certainly much improved from when I had visited when there were buckets in the galleries at mm -hmm. one point. <laughs> um, Mary, a question for you about Burrell, the, the collector then. Um, he obviously amassed this, like, as you pointed out several times, probably the largest private collection ever. And I just wondered whether in his letters there was any insight into his own relationship with an experience with stained glass in terms of when he might have first become interested in it, whether he went out to visit stained glass in cathedrals or churches, or whether really he was someone who sat at home and enjoyed buying things at auction. Yeah, I think, because as Ed had touched upon as well, there's very little about Burrell as a man and what caused him to sort of go as far as he did. I mean, I think it wouldn't be uncommon for any one of his level of wealth to have dabbled in the art market. Um, it was the fact that he took it to the extreme, I think, is the most weird thing about him. And there's nothing that really particularly explains that other than he had the time, he was retired at this point since, and obviously he lived actually quite a long life after his retirement. So he had a, a vast amount of time and a vast amount of money that he could just chip away at the hobby that probably became a bit of an obsession for him. Um, but there's no real, there's never really any strong indication about why he did anything really. It just sort of, he just could, I suppose, it's, it's an extraordinary story, even if we don't know the whole story. Um, it's still very interesting to hear from the kind of beginning right up to present day. So um, thank you both for that. And you mentioned Dix, the Dixon collection, Mary. Um, are there, is that available to visit? And are there other collections that you, of private collectors that people could visit? I, I guess globally, because we're talking on that scale at this point. Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, Thomas and Drake furnished the houses of many of the American, uh, many of the big American collectors. And yeah, beyond the sort of all the major museums across the world, which all have some sprinkling of Thomas and Drake glass in. Um, yeah, really, it's uh, the sort of Boston area, the um, New York area, they all have huge concentrations of um, English manor house style uh, wealthy American houses that you can go and visit that do have um, Thomas and Drake glass in. They're, none of them they were on the sort of highly concentrated scale of um, Hutton Castle though I think that was it was so unusual. The Dixon collection now is part of a museum so again it's like the Borrell collection in that it got removed and transplanted elsewhere. So, of course, you can go to Philadelphia and you can look at um, lots of examples of that um, collection there. But, you know, it's sad, I think, that no collection that was of that vast scale remained um, within within a house. Um, you know, and obviously, I don't know, Ed, if you know really about it, why, why Hutton Castle was entirely abandoned as a result of the gifting. You know, why they, you know, they had this idea that they were going to... Um, uh, reassemble some of the rooms why didn't they just open that house as well as have a museum separately because they had enough enough of a collection for both didn't they yeah yeah they did i mean i know with the initial gift hutton was included i don't think it was ever going to be a suitable place for the collection because it was it's not close enough to glasgow so there's that there's that issue um but the, the house was in the initial gift as far as i remember but the issue was that it just sort of was different the upkeep of it and by the time you've taken out the entire collection and i do mean the entire collection i mean all the wood paneling i mean the fireplaces you know everything was stripped from that um i'm not really sure you know were, we see photos of it and it's in a pretty sorry state by the, by the time that uh, lady burrell dies in the 60s and i just think just the upkeep of it just made it impossible the costs so, so it's now in private ownership again um, um so i don't know what state it's in inside anymore no idea and also they they don't want you coming to their house no they do not if anyone's, want... yeah if anyone's inspired yes. by this to go to and and knock on the door don't <laughs> <laughs>
Well, thank you both for such um, an informative um, evening. And I think actually the fact that there aren't many questions from our uh, attendees is actually because of how thorough you both were. And every time I had a question, you you answered it as you were talking. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you. Um, it's really great to hear more about the, the Burrell collection. Um, it's, it's formation and as it is today, looking spectacular. I know that there are new guides to the collection, um, but this is also a good uh, little guide that you can easily get to the, the stained glass for those who are particularly interested in the stained glass. And I'm sure um, you already know of it if you know your stained glass, but if you want to read more actually about some of the pieces, um, I refer you to this and also to the Glasgow Museum's uh, website as um, Ed has kindly. Yes. So um, I, on behalf of all of our attendees who I know are applauding from home, um, thank you, Ed, and thank you, Mary, so much. Um, I'm going to just remind people of next week's talk. Um, so bear with me. Can you see my screen? Yes, right now. Make sure that I'm sharing the right screen. Next week on Wednesday, we have um, a talk um, on Pauline Boaty, who was one of the um, women, actually one of the only women in the British pop art movement. Um, she's best known for her paintings and her collages, but actually started out in stained glass. And we're going to hear from Dr. Sue Tate um, about um, her stained glass. So that's one not to miss. Um, tickets are still available. And I'd like to thank you all for attending this series of talks. Um, it's very stimulating to have these, these talks and to be able to invite people from across the world. I know we've got people from Canada uh, joining us this evening. And they also are a way of supporting the unique museum that is our stained glass museum. And if you're interested in learning more about the museum, please do visit our website. And if you care passionately about stained glass, please do consider joining our friends as well, because we are a small independent charity and our collection could do with an uplift, much like the Burrell has had recently. So um, all your support is very much uh, needed and we're very grateful for it. So good night, everyone. And thank you once again to Ed Johnson um, and Mary Grohl. Good night. <laughs>